Chapter 3 The Transitional Period Is the Church of the Acts the body of Christ? Here is perhaps nothing about which the ultra-dispensationalists are more certain, according to their own expressions, than that the Book of the Acts covers a transitional period, coming in between the age of the law and the present age in which the dispensation of mystery has been revealed. Acts is a transitional period in which the prophecy dispensation is set aside at Acts 7, and God begins the mystery dispensation with Paul in Acts 9. It is a book to Israel covering both programs. Acts 1 to 7 covers the fall of Israel in their program, and Acts 9 to 28 covers the diminishing away of Israel in the grace program. They do not always agree as to the name of this intervening period. Some call it the Kingdom Church, others the Jewish Church, and there are those who prefer the term Pentecostal Dispensation. Genesis 12, Acts 7 is the prophecy dispensation. Acts 9 Philemon covers the mystery dispensation, with the instructions for us today found in Romans Philemon. Hebrews Revelation covers the resumption of the prophecy dispensation after the rapture of the body of Christ. The general teaching is about as follows. It is affirmed that the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and his baptizing the 120 and those who afterwards believed, did not have anything to do with the formation of the Church, the Body of Christ. It did not have anything to do with forming the Body of Christ, because it was in Paul first, that, Jesus Christ might shew forth all long-suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him, to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. On the contrary, they insist that the Church, throughout all of the Book of Acts up to Paul's imprisonment, was of an altogether lower order than that of the Epistle to the Ephesians. The Church of God in Israel's program is not of a lower order than today's Church. It is all of God, also. The Body of Christ started in Acts 9 with Paul, not at the end of Acts. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 16 that in me first Jesus Christ might shew forth all long-suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life. Therefore, God clearly started something new with Paul. Assemblies in Judea, Samaria, and the various Gentile countries were simply groups of believers who were waiting for the manifestation of the kingdom and had not yet come into the full liberty of grace. This does not make them a lower order. It just means that they had not received the atonement yet, Acts 3 verses 19 to 21, like we have today, Romans 5 verse 11, but they will receive the new covenant at Jesus' second coming, which is not any lower than our positions in heavenly places as part of the body of Christ today. The people in early Acts are in an earlier stage of their dispensation than we are today. They had been placed under the law of Moses, which did not go away with the cross of Christ. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall I and no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled, Matthew 5 verse 18. By contrast, the body of Christ is not under the law, but under grace, Romans 6 verse 14. The ordinances of the Lord's Supper and of baptism were linked with these companies and were to continue only until Israel had definitely and finally refused the gospel message, not so. Water baptism for salvation was done away with at the stoning of Stephen. There are water baptisms after that, but they were done so as not to offend others. There was no spiritual significance behind water baptism anymore. The Lord's Supper has continued in today's dispensation, as Paul mentions how it should be done. Therefore, it is for both dispensations after the cross, after which the full revelation of the mystery is supposed to have been given to the Apostle Paul when he was imprisoned at Rome. In Acts 26 verse 16, Paul mentions that Jesus told him that he would be a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 1, Paul says, I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Thus, Jesus told Paul that the mystery would not be revealed to him all at once. In Colossians 1 verse 25, Paul says that the mystery was given to him to fulfill the word of God. Therefore, it is scripture itself that tells us that there is a progressive revelation of the mystery, and that the full revelation of the mystery had been given to Paul by the time he wrote Colossians. Which was after Acts, 28. From that time on a new dispensation began. 
Acts 28 Dispensationalists do not understand that the miracles, water baptism, and spiritual gifts found in Acts 9-28 are related to the diminishing away of Israel during the dispensation of grace, Romans 11 verse 12. Their going away after Acts 28 shows that Israel had diminished away, and that the word of God was completed. It does not signal a dispensational change. Surely this is wrongly confounding the word of truth. How any rational and spiritually minded person could ever come to such a conclusion after a careful reading of the book of Acts, and with it the various epistles addressed to the churches and peoples mentioned in that book, is more than some of us can comprehend. Let us see what the facts actually are. How can any rational and spiritually minded person not see, by reading these books, that Paul was given a new and distinct gospel and message known as the mystery? In the first place, it is perfectly plain that the Church, the body of Christ, was formed by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Very definitely, very definitely. Does Ironside think such competent terms will cause us to ignore the evidence of God's Word? The body of Christ is only used four times in Scripture and all by Paul, Romans 7 verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10 verse 16, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27, and Ephesians 4 verse 12. How then is it perfectly plain that the body of Christ started in Acts 2, when you would never even know that term if not for Paul's epistles? This term is used of that great event which took place at Pentecost and was repeated in measure in Cornelius' household. In each instance, the same exact expression is used. Referring to Pentecost, our Lord says, Ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence, Acts 1 verse 5. Being baptized with the Holy Ghost is different from four by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. The baptism with the Holy Ghost in Acts 1 is defined as power to be witnesses unto Christ in Jerusalem, Judea, etc., Acts 1 verse 8. The baptism by one spirit into Christ's body has to do with our spiritual circumcision at salvation, being spiritually baptized into Christ's death, such that the body of sins is destroyed, and we are risen to life in Christ, Colossians 2 verses 10 to 14, dot. Referring to the event That took place in Cornelius' household, Peter says. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Forasmuch then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I, that I could withstand God? Acts 11 verses 16 and 17. In saying them and us, Peter is referring to a dispensational change. Peter said to Cornelius, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10 verse 34. This is different from what Jesus told him before Acts 9, when he said, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6. Jesus himself would not even acknowledge a Gentile woman, who was pleading for mercy, because I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verses 23 to 24. After the dispensational change in Acts 9, Peter understands that the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile has been taken down in the mystery dispensation, Ephesians 2 verse 14. The dispensational change can also be seen in that the Holy Ghost fell on them as Peter began to speak. Acts 11 verse 15. Before Acts 9, Peter said that they had to repent and be water baptized before they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 verse 38. Now, in Acts 11, we see that only believing the mystery gospel is required to receive the Holy Ghost. Now, it is true that the Holy Ghost fell in Acts 11 as it did in Acts 2, but that does not mean there was not a dispensational change, as we have pointed out a couple of doctrinal changes already seen after Acts 8. The reason the Holy Ghost fell in Acts 11 as it did in Acts 2 is to provoke Israel to jealousy, Romans 11 verse 11. God's will is for all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. Since the Jews require a sign, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22, God gave the sign of the Holy Ghost falling upon saved Gentiles in the mystery dispensation, so that Israel may also believe the gospel and be saved. Therefore, just because God gave the Holy Ghost in Acts 11, as he did in Acts 2, it does not mean that a dispensational change did not occur. The fact that doctrine changed shows that a change occurred. 
In 1 Corinthians 12 verses 12 and 13, we read, For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. Here we are distinctly informed as to the way in which the body has been brought into existence, and this is exactly what took place at Pentecost. Individual believers were that day baptized into one body, and from then on the Lord added to the church daily, such as were saved. How is that? 1 Corinthians 12 is the passage that talks about believers being baptized into one body, not Acts 2. In Acts 2, the middle wall of partition is still up between Jew and Gentile. In fact, in Acts 2 verses 14 and 22 and 36, Peter specifically addresses Jews with, Ye men of Judea, ye men of Israel, and the house of Israel, respectively. Therefore, his audience was Jewish. Acts 2 verse 41 says they were baptized. It says nothing about the Spirit baptizing them into one body. Acts 2 verse 47 says that the Lord added to the church. It says nothing about them becoming members of the body of Christ. Ironside claims that the church started in Acts 2, yet Acts 7 verse 38 says that Israel in the wilderness under Moses was the church in the wilderness. Therefore, the church of God had been in existence for over 1,000 years before Acts 2, and the church's existence continued in Acts 2. Ironside does not say that, since the church was in existence in Moses' day, that Israel back then was part of the body of Christ. That is because the body of Christ is only mentioned by Paul. How, then, can Ironside read the body of Christ back into Peter's message in Acts 2? It is a significant fact that if you omit this definite passage in 1 Corinthians, there is no other verse in any epistle that tells us in plain words just how the body is formed, although we might deduce this from Ephesians 4 verse 4, where we read, there is one. Body and One Spirit Undoubtedly this refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, by which the body is formed, in contradistinction to water baptism in the next verse. What? Ephesians 4 verse 5 says that there is only one baptism, yet Ironside says there is baptism of the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4 verse 4, and a water baptism in Ephesians 4 verse 5. As such, Ironside does not believe God's word. But this is simply interpretation, this is more than interpretation. It is changing the truth of God into a lie, and all might not agree as to it. But there can surely be no question as to the application of the passage in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13. Yet, singularly enough, the very people who insist that the body is formed by the Spirit's baptism, declare that these Corinthians were not members of the body, nor did that body come into existence until at least four or five years afterwards. Yes, that does not make any sense. Ironside is criticizing the Acts 28 position. The only explanation that fits is a mid-Acts position. Such a position allows us to see the Corinthians as part of the body of Christ, because the body started in Acts 9 with Paul first, not after Acts 28, while recognizing that those saved in Acts 2 were not part of the body, since it had not started yet. A careful reading of the book of Acts shows us the gradual manner in which the truth of the new dispensation was introduced, the truth of the new dispensation? In Acts? What is Ironside talking about? He seems to be contradicting himself. Perhaps I need to rightly divide his paper to understand what he is saying. Ha ha, he just finished arguing that the Gospels apply today. Now, he says that they are of a previous dispensation, since a new dispensation started with the book of Acts. So, which is it? If the previous argument is his position, a new dispensation began with Matthew 1. If what he is saying now is his true position, the new dispensation began with Acts 1, and his former point of the Gospels applying today is no longer valid. So, the Gospels really do not apply today. Or maybe they do? Oh, that's right, John applies, Matthew does not, and Mark and Luke apply if you feel like it. Are you confused yet? Yet, Ironside claims that right dividers are the ones confused. And, how could the new dispensation begin in Acts 1, when Jesus and his disciples were still talking about Israel becoming a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles to reconcile the earth back to God, see Acts 1 verses 6 to 8, 
and this is what has led some to speak of this book as covering a transitional period. If Ironside would just recognize that the transitional period is in Acts 9 to 28, rather than the whole book of Acts, he would be right on and his whole doctrinal outlook would completely change. Personally, I have no objection to the term transitional period if it be understood that the transition was in the minds of men and not in the mind of God. The problem with this statement is that Romans 11 verse 12 refers to the diminishing of Israel. Since Israel gradually was taken off the scene, then a transitional period is in the mind of God, as well. According to God, the new dispensation, that in which we now live, the dispensation of the grace of God, otherwise called the dispensation of the mystery, began the moment the Spirit descended at Pentecost. This view contradicts scripture. In Acts 3 verse 21, Peter says that what he was preaching hath been spoken by God by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. In Romans 16 verses 25 to 26, Paul says that the revelation of the mystery was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. Therefore, if Peter preached prophecy in Acts 3 and the mystery was given to Paul directly by Jesus Christ no earlier than Acts 9, Ephesians 3 verse 3, since Paul was a blasphemer before then, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, it is impossible for the dispensation of the mystery to have begun in Acts 2. If you want to know what the Spirit descending at Pentecost meant, read what the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of Peter, says it is, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, Acts 2 verse 16, in Joel 2 verses 28 to 32, Joel 2 colon 27-28a says, And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Therefore, the pouring out of the Spirit in Acts 2 means that God is in the midst of Israel, and He will now come upon all people in Israel, not just the Levites. The subject, then, is Israel and has nothing to do with the body of Christ, where there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, Galatians 3 verse 28. That moment the one body came into existence, though at the beginning it was composed entirely of believers taken out from the Jewish people. But in the minds even of the disciples, there was a long period before they all fully entered into the special work that God had begun to do. That is because the special work of the mystery dispensation did not begin until Acts 9. That is why those scattered abroad in Acts 8 verse 1 preached the word only to the Jews, Acts 11 verse 19. Many of them, in fact, probably never did apprehend the true character of this dispensation, as we shall see further on. Those saved in Israel's program remained in Israel's program. That is why, as late as Acts 21, we see James saying that the Jews, saved in Israel's program, were still all zealous of the law, Acts 21 verse 20. By then, they understood the mystery program, but they followed the instructions God gave them to follow in their program. The position is often taken that the twelve apostles were very ignorant of what the Lord was really doing, and that their entire ministry was toward Israel. Have not such teachers forgotten that during the forty days that the Lord appeared to his disciples before ascending to heaven, he taught them exactly what his program was, and the part they were to have in it? In Acts 1 verses 3 and 4, we read, He also showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should know, depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. Has Ironside forgotten that the book of Acts does not stop at Acts 1 verse 4? Has he not read Acts 1 verse 6, where the apostles ask Jesus the question, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? After Jesus spent forty days with them speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, they would have been clear on what God was doing, which is why they were going to Israel. If they were wrong in that thinking, Jesus would have cleared that up right away. However, Jesus did not correct their thinking. Rather, he just told them that it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, Acts 1 verse 7. He did not say, O ye of little faith, have ye not heard what I have told you the last forty days, that the kingdom of God is for everyone, not just Israel? No, Jesus specifically taught them that God was restoring the kingdom to Israel. 
Jesus commissioned them to go to Israel. Therefore, their ministry was only to Israel. They just did not know when the kingdom would be restored. And it was then that he distinctly told them of the coming baptism of the Holy Spirit. According to the divine plan, the gospel message was first to be proclaimed in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria, and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Yes, they were to go to Israel first, but, according to Matthew 10 verse 23, they would not go unto the uttermost parts of the earth, i.e., the Gentiles, until after Jesus' second coming. Therefore, even when saved Israel was scattered due to persecution, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem, Acts 8 verse 1, in obedience to Jesus' instructions, since Jerusalem, as a whole, was not saved yet. This is exactly what we find in the book of Acts. The earlier chapters give us the proclamation in Jerusalem and Judea. Then we have Philip going down to Samaria, followed by John and Peter. That happened after Jesus put Israel's program on hold in Acts 7 verse 55, and Samaria was the capital city of the northern territory of Israel. Therefore, Philip was still going to the Jews only. Note that Jesus himself, commissioned by God the Father to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel only, Matthew 15 verse 24, also went to Samaria, John 4. Later, Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, and he and his household, believing the gospel, are baptized by the same spirit into the same body. This did not happen until Acts 10, which is after God gave a new commission to Paul in Acts 9 verse 15, which put on hold the old commission in Acts 1 verse 8. Again, where is the term body in Acts 10? We are just told that Cornelius was water baptized, Acts 10 verse 48. The conversion of Saul of Tarsus prepares the way for a worldwide ministry, he being specifically chosen of God for that testimony. If Acts 9 verse 15 is a continuation of Acts 1 verse 8 and the Jews have already been taken care of by the other apostles, as Ironside implies, Jesus would have sent Paul to the Gentiles only. Instead, Acts 9 verse 15 says that Paul would go to the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The fact that Paul goes to Israel, as well as to the Gentiles, shows that God starting something new with Paul. But before Saul's conversion, there were churches of God in many cities, and these churches of God together formed the Church of God, churches signifying local companies, but the Church of God taking in all believers. Yes, it was the Church of God. That just means that there were groups of believers found in all the territories. It does not mean that God started the body of Christ in Acts 2. In fact, Acts 2 verse 5 says that there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven, Acts 2 verse 5. The reason is, because Israel's program was still going on at the time, and they were in Jerusalem, waiting for God to establish His eternal kingdom there soon, since the 70 weeks of Daniel had almost come to a close by then. 3,000 of these devout Jews, Acts 2 verse 41, repented and were water baptized as part of the gospel of the kingdom for Israel, Acts 2 verse 38. Then, when they were scattered abroad in Judea and Samaria in Acts 8 verse 1, they would have established local churches in those regions, as Acts 9 verse 31 indicates. Years afterwards, Paul writes, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, Gal. 113, yes, all believers in Israel's program would be considered the church of God. That is not a term that is exclusive to the current dispensation. And again, for I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God, I cor. 15 colon 9, the church of God was to him one whole. Yes, the church of God consists of all believers from all dispensations. The body of Christ, however, is only for the current dispensation and did not begin until Acts 9. You do not even see the term body of Christ mentioned in the book of Acts. It was exactly the same church of God as that of which he speaks in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15, when, writing to the younger preacher, he says, that thou mightest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. In the meantime, he had been cast into prison and had written all the rest of the so-called prison epistles, with the exception, of course, of Titus, which was written while he was at liberty, between his imprisonments, and 2 Timothy, which was written during his second imprisonment asterisk. 
Asterisk I make this statement on the supposition that the note at the end of 1 Timothy is correct. Namely, that the epistle was written from Laodicea, a place not visited by Paul, before his first imprisonment. If written earlier, the argument does not apply, except to show that Paul ever recognized the Church of God as one and undivided. Yes, the Church of God is one and undivided. Praise the Lord for the unity that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is no hint of any difference having come in to distinguish the Church of God which he says he persecuted, from the Church of God in which Timothy was recognized as a minister of the Word. It is one and the same Church throughout. Yes, all those saved in all dispensations are part of the one Church of God. However, there is a distinction made between the two programs. Galatians 2 verse 9 says that the leaders of both programs agreed that Paul and Barnabas would go to the heathen, while the apostles of Israel's program would confine their ministry to the circumcision. The heathen includes all unsaved Jews, because we see Paul going to the Jew first throughout the book of Acts, and we see that Jesus specifically commissioned him to go to the children of Israel, as well as the Gentiles, Acts 9 verse 15. The circumcision, then, would be only the Jews saved in Israel's program. Therefore, it is the same church, but it is different parts of the church due to different dispensations. God reconciles the earth back to himself in Israel's program, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, and he reconciles the heaven back to himself in today's mystery program, Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 22, 2 colon 6. Going back to Acts then, we notice that after his conversion, Paul is definitely set apart as the apostle to the Gentiles, and yet everywhere he goes, he first seeks out his Jewish brethren after the flesh, because it was God's purpose that the gospel should be made known to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. Yes, even though the Jews rejected the kingdom message, they are still given the grace message first before the Gentiles are. That is part of the diminishing away of Israel, Romans 11 verse 12. In practically every city, the same results follow. A few of the Jews receive the message, the bulk of them reject it. Then Paul turns from the Jews to the Gentiles, and thus the message goes out to the whole world. Throughout all of this period, covered by the ministries of Peter and Paul, particularly, both baptism in water and the breaking of bread have their place. Water baptism is part of the gospel that Peter preached for salvation, Acts 2 verse 38. Paul said that Christ sent him not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Therefore, the place of water baptism changes from Peter's ministry to Paul's ministry. The only reason Paul did baptize some people was so as not to offend Jewish brethren saved under the kingdom dispensation. With Peter, Acts 2 verse 41 says that all 3,000 people saved at that time were water baptized. Peter did not say, look, there are only 120 of us, of which only 12 are apostles, add there are 3,000 of you, we will baptize you as we get around to it. No. Peter knew they did not have eternal life until they were water baptized, Mark 16 verse 16, Acts 2 verse 38. Therefore, all 3,000 were baptized that day, Acts 2 verse 41. On the other hand, when people were saved under Paul in the Corinthian church, and it was, no doubt, less than 3,000, who were saved, Paul says that he baptized only a handful and is not sure about the others, 1 Corinthians 1 verses 14 to 17. This shows that the importance of water baptism completely changed from Acts 2 to Acts 9. Breaking of bread is found in every dispensation, because everyone has to eat, regardless of dispensation. Therefore, it would have continued with the change in dispensation. The signs of an apostle follow the ministry, God authenticating his word as his servants go forth in his name. However, it is perfectly plain that the nearer we get to the close of the Acts, the less we have in the way of signs and wonders. Because the word of God was being written and could be relied upon for authenticating the gospel message, rather than signs. This is to be expected. Yes. Mark 16 verse 20 shows the Lord. Confirming the words with signs following. Ephesians 4 verse 13 says that the gifts were given till we all come in the unity of the faith. The mystery doctrine was given to Paul to fulfill the word of God, Colossians 1 verse 25. Once it was fulfilled, the word of God confirms the gospel, not signs. Therefore, the signs continue until Acts 28. 
Since Ironside does not believe this, why would he expect the signs to be done away with at the end of Acts? Jesus commissioned the disciples to go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16 verse 15, and the gospel was confirmed with signs following, Mark 16 verse 20. If there is no change in dispensation, the signs would have continued at least until Jesus' second coming, since Jesus said, Ye shall not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. Why would they stop at the end of Acts? If you do not recognize the mystery dispensation, you have no way of explaining the cessation of the sign gifts, which is why Ironside offers no explanation as to why he expected the signs would be done away with. In the meantime, various books of the New Testament had been written, particularly Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, the Corinthians, and the Romans. In all likelihood, the epistle of James had also been produced, though we cannot definitely locate the time of its writing. The epistles of Peter and of John come afterward. They were not part of the earlier written ministry. Everywhere that Paul goes, he preaches the kingdom as the Lord himself has commanded, that's right. He preaches the gospel, given to him by direct revelation of Jesus Christ, Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. He did not preach the same message that Peter preached, as Galatians 2 verse 7 says that two different gospels were committed to Peter and Paul and finally, he reached Rome a prisoner. There, following his usual custom, though not having the same liberty as in other places, he gets in touch first with the leaders of the Jewish people, gives them his message, and then tells them that even though they reject it, yet the purpose of God must be carried out, and the salvation of God sent to the Gentiles. This is supposed by many to be a dispensational break, as I have stated before, the Dispensational break is at Acts 9. The end of Acts signals the end of the mystery gospel, going to the Jews. If the rejection by the Jews does not change something, then why does the book of Acts end where it does? It would have at least continued until the end of Paul's life. But, the book of Acts records God's dealings with Israel only. Therefore, when God stops dealing with Israel, the book of Acts stops, but we have exactly the same thing in the 13th chapter of Acts. There we read from verse 44 on, how the Jews in Antioch of Pisidia withstood the word spoken by Paul, and Paul and Barnabas waxed bold, and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee to be a light of the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be or salvation unto the ends of the earth. I ask any thoughtful reader, what difference is there between this account of Paul's dealing with the Jews, the proclamation of grace going out to the Gentiles, and that found in chapter 28 of this same book? The difference is that the rejection in Acts 28 ends the book of Acts, which shows God is finished with the nation of Israel at that time. Another proof of this is the cessation of the sign gifts at that time. In early Acts, Israel rejects the gospel of the kingdom multiple times before Jesus puts the program on hold at the stoning of Stephen. Similarly, in Acts 9-28, Israel rejects the mystery gospel multiple times before God has Paul go exclusively to the Gentiles at the end of Acts. In the light of these two passages, may we not say that if Paul was given liberty, as we know he was, to preach for several years after his first imprisonment, he undoubtedly still followed exactly the same method of proclaiming the gospel to the Jew first, and then to the Gentiles? Nope. God must have told him to stop going to the Jew. Otherwise, the book of Acts would have continued until Paul's death, and so would have the sign gifts. It is passing strange that these ultra-dispensationalists can overlook a passage like Acts 13, and then read so much into the similar portion in chapter 28. We have not overlooked Acts 13. We just notice that Paul continues going to the Jew first after Acts 13. Therefore, no change had been made. However, at Acts 28, we see that Paul does not go to the Jew anymore. Therefore, we can conclude that the diminishing away of Israel has occurred. It is all about what happens as a result of the event, not the event itself. According to them, as we have pointed out, the dispensational break occurred at this latter time, after which Paul's ministry, they tell us, took an entirely different form. 
It was then that the dispensation of the mystery was revealed to him, they say, which he embodied in his prison epistles. He was no longer a preacher of the kingdom, but now a minister of the body. Not true. Paul's gospel and his doctrine did not change. The only things that changed were that his audience was only Gentile now, and that Paul received further revelation of the mystery that he shared in Ephesians, Colossians. The theory sounds very plausible until one examines the text of scripture itself. Let us look at the last two verses of Acts, 28. And Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house, and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. Now observe in chapter 1, verse 3, our Lord is said to have spoken to his disciples during 40 days of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. In the very last verse of the book, after Paul's supposed later revelation, he is still preaching the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, like the church of God, is a generic term, God's. kingdom will be on the earth with Israel ruling and in heaven with the body of Christ ruling. Both heaven and earth belong to God's kingdom. Therefore, Peter could preach the kingdom of God in Acts 2 and be referring to God's kingdom on earth, while Paul could preach the kingdom of God in Acts 28 and be referring God's kingdom in heaven. Certainly the next phrase, teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, implies continuance in exactly the same type of ministry in which he had been engaged before. There is no hint here of something new. Acts 1 verse 3 says that Jesus only shared with the believing remnant of Israel the things concerning the kingdom of God. There is no mention of teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ. That is because, in Acts 1 verse 3, they kept teaching the law, while Paul, beginning in Acts 9, taught grace. The term the Lord Jesus Christ occurs first in scripture in Acts 11 verse 17. It was not until Jesus' ascension to heaven that he was made both Lord and Christ, Acts 2 verse 36. Now let us go back a little. In chapter 20 of the book of Acts, we find the Apostle Paul at Miletus on his way to Jerusalem. From there, he sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. We have a very touching account of his last interview with them. Among other things, he says to them, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20 verses 27 and 28. And then he commends these elders in view of the coming apostasy, not to some new revelation yet to be given, but to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are. sanctified. Note particularly the breadth of the statement found in verse 27. All the counsel of God had already been made known through Paul to the Ephesian elders before he went up to Jerusalem for the last time. There is not a hint of a partial revelation, not a hint of a transitional period, but they already had everything they needed to keep them until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. All the counsel of God must refer to all that had been revealed to Paul already. If it was everything that would be revealed, there would have been no need to write the same Ephesian church a six-chapter epistle after Acts 28. He wrote that epistle because he had new information that he did not have at the time that he spoke to the Ephesians in Acts 20. He wrote to the Ephesian church of the heavenly positions that they would occupy. There is no mention of this in his epistles written before Acts 28. Also, since Ironside has brought up Acts 20, Paul told the Ephesians in this same passage that he testified to them of the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20 verse 24. Contrast this with Matthew 24 verse 14, where Jesus said that, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. This shows that Paul preached a different gospel than the twelve apostles preached. I venture to say that the better one is acquainted with the book of Acts, the clearer all this will become. 2 Timothy 2 verse 7, consider what I say and the Lord give the understanding in all things. God contradicts Ironside by saying that, the better one is acquainted with Paul's epistles, the clearer all this will become. It is truly absurd to attempt to make two churches out of the redeemed company between Pentecost and the Lord's return. The church is one and indivisible. No one is making two churches here. They are all in the church of God, but those saved before Acts 9 are part of the bride of Christ, and those saved after Paul are part of the body of Christ. 
If you make both one, then there is no bride for Christ to marry, yet he does have a wife, according to Revelation 21 verse 9, and he has a body, according to 1 Corinthians 12 verse 27. It is the church that Christ built upon the rock, namely the truth that he is the Son of the living God. It is the church of God which he purchased with the blood of his own. Son. That church of God, Saul in his ignorance, persecuted. Of that same church of God, he afterwards became a member through the Spirit's baptism. In that church of God, Timothy was a recognized minister, not only before, but after Paul's imprisonment. Jesus said in Matthew 12 verses 31 to 32 that the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven. Acts 7 verse 55 says that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost when they stoned him to death. Acts 8 verse 1 says that Paul consented to his death. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 verse 13 that he was before a blasphemer. Putting all these verses together, I think it is safe to say that Paul blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Yet, Jesus said he would not be forgiven if he did so. The way he was forgiven was because God started a new program with Paul. Jesus said that the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come, Matthew 12 verse 32. This eliminates forgiveness in Israel's program, but it does not eliminate forgiveness in the mystery program. If you believe Ironside, there is no getting around Paul going to the lake of fire. In regard to the statement so frequently made that God was giving Israel a second chance throughout the book of Acts, it is evident that there is no foundation whatever for such a statement. That is not true. In Acts 7 verse 60, Stephen says, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. In Acts 9 verse 15, Paul is sent to both Gentiles and Jews. In Romans 11 verse 12, Acts 9 to 28 is described as a diminishing away of the Jews. In Luke 13 verses 6 to 9, Jesus asks for and receives a one-year grace period for Israel in Acts 1 to 7. Therefore, Israel gets a second chance under their program in Acts 1 to 7, and they get a third chance under the mystery program in Acts 9 to 28. Our Lord definitely declared the setting aside of Israel for this entire age when he said, Your house is left unto you desolate. Ye shall not see me again until ye say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have already gone over this. Why would Jesus set aside Israel in Matthew 23 verse 38, only to tell his disciples in Acts 1 verse 8 to go to Israel first? Also, why would he tell the disciples that they will spend the entire tribulation period going to the cities of Israel, Matthew 10 verse 23, when Israel has been completely set aside? Obviously, these scriptures tell us that the Lord did not set aside Israel. with his statement in Matthew 23 verse 38. It was after that house was left desolate that the glorious proclamation at Pentecost was given through the power of the Holy Spirit, offering salvation by grace to any in Israel who repented, Peter said, repent and be baptized, for the remission of sins in Acts 2 verse 38. Therefore, salvation was by faith plus works, as James says in James 2 verse 24, by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Contrast this with Romans 3 verse 28, where Paul tells us today, a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. As such, the gospel of grace was not offered to Israel in Acts 2, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call, which, of course, includes the whole Gentile world. Not once in any of the sermons recorded of Peter and of Paul do we have a hint that the nation of Israel is still on trial, and that God is waiting for that nation to repent in this age. How about repent and be baptized, Acts 2 verse 38, which was spoken to ye men of Israel, Acts 2 verse 22, or repent ye therefore, Acts 3 verse 19, which was spoken to ye men of Israel, Acts 3 verse 12. How about today, if ye will hear his voice, Hebrews 3 verse 15, 4 colon 7, with the warning of let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief, Hebrews 4 verse 11, and exhort one another daily, while it is called to day, Hebrews 3 verse 13, God is telling Israel that they must be saved today. On the contrary, the very fact that believers are called upon to save themselves from that untoward generation is evidence of the complete setting aside of Israel nationally, and the calling out of a select company of those who acknowledge the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ.
No, saving themselves from that untoward generation, Acts 2 verse 40, means that the physical nation of Israel is being replaced with a nation of Israel that has faith in God. Matthew 21 verse 43 says, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. If this included Gentiles, Jesus would have said nations, not nation. Numbers 23, 9 says that Israel shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Therefore, this nation must be Israel. Also, Jesus said, Salvation is of the Jews, John 4 verse 22. By their baptism, they outwardly severed the link that bound them to the unbelieving nation, and thus came over onto Christian ground. Wrong again. They severed the link and came over to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matthew 21 verse 43. The first time the word Christian is used is in Acts 11 verse 26. The reason is because we follow Christ's doctrine given to us today by the Apostle Paul, while, in Israel's dispensation, they followed the Mosaic law. Therefore, there was no Christian ground for anyone to come over onto until it was established with Paul by Christ from heaven in Acts 9. To this company, Gentile believers were later added, and these two together constitute the body of Christ. Again, the term body of Christ is only used by Paul in his epistles and cannot be applied to those saved before Acts 9. It is perfectly true that the body as such is not mentioned in the book of Acts, and that for a very good reason. In this book, we have the record of the beginning of the evangelization of the world, really? For the most part, only Jews are mentioned in Acts. Paul's ministry to the Gentiles is not mentioned much, even though he had written most of his epistles before the end of Acts. That is because Luke's purpose in writing Acts was to record the fall and diminishing away of Israel. Furthermore, Ironside's argument makes no sense. The body of Christ is a place where there is neither Jew nor Greek, Galatians 3 verse 28. Therefore, recording the beginning of the evangelization of the world is an argument for mentioning the body of Christ, not against it. If Acts really recorded this evangelization, the body of Christ would have been mentioned, which involves, of course, not the revelation of the truth of the body, but the proclamation of the kingdom of God, which none can enter apart from the new birth. Ironside has terms confused again. Being born again, John 3 verse 3, is a term that identifies specifically with Israel. Israel was God's firstborn, Exodus 4 verse 22, but, due to sin, it became Satan's lawful captive, Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25. It was then up to each Jew to decide to be born again and become part of the nation God was forming as a kingdom of priests to reconcile the Gentiles back to God. In the dispensation of grace, the term born again is never used. Rather, we are a new creature in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. A careful study of the epistles, taking particular note of the times at which, and the persons to whom, they were written will only serve to make these things clearer. Yes, Ironside should do a careful study of Paul's epistles in order to understand the differences between Israel's program and the mystery program, 